uh, the life's like <laughs> things are becoming going back to normal you know oh covid just, wise yeah yeah you know it's just like my whole week is filled <laughs> with work and hanging out again which is bizarre yeah yeah there's right now there's a group of uh there's a group of guys and girls men and women from the church all having a kind of a meeting we gathered yesterday and discussed you know hey what do we, what do we want what, what what do we see like what are our convictions of what a church should be and uh, mike mike brown sort of facilitated it and uh I will. And then now we're uh, now they're all just kind of meeting, going over the notes, and, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's great. Well, I hope I hope among those convictions, polka dots were mentioned because obviously it's polka dot day, Christian. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> do I have a Do I have oh. a shirt? Do I have a polka dot shirt? I don't think so. Too late. Oh, you are not in touch with the spirit, man. Only us oh. you guys. <laughs> oh, I, got, I have so much to learn. Dude, Teach blessed me. Are, blessed are the polka dotted. Teach me. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Hooray. Hello. All right, I'll go Hello. this way. Oh, that's better. That's better, Christian. Yeah. yeah. Good. All right. Hey, uh, be, before I open up in prayer... Let me do a little pop quiz and someone uh, so, someone give the overview of the Sermon on the Mount and the three ways and where we are. Uh, Christian, you're going or me? Okay, you go. so the, the first one was uh, we need help. The first section was we need help. All about that's recognizing. Called the, the, we're going to tag team this, and that's called the purgative way. <laughs> it applies to the first three Beatitudes and the rest of chapter five. That's right. And the idea of, of our, we are limited, knowing our limitations. Um, the next section is about, oh, is this the show me how? Show this me how. Show the, me eliminative, how? the eliminative way. So the next three Beatitudes. And then chapter six works it out. And then the final one is God is good or heaven is the kingdom of heaven is great or everything in god's world is better than our world absolutely and that's called that's called the union or u- unitive union unitive way unitive it's the la- last three beatitudes and chapter seven there you go all right yeah, teamwork. teamwork thanks Matthew. Christian. way to go the <laughs> best way to best way to learn is what, what do you call it collegially or uh i mean there's collaboratively a collaboratively that's the word collaborative okay. learning we just did it we just did it. there you go all right lord jesus thank you for the blessing and being together and as we talk about that that second dynamic uh the illuminative way show me how uh, just boy be with us amen amen all right, hey, I've got I got lots of stuff I can talk about or I can bring up for conversation. So I, I want to be very kind of loose in the saddle and not necessarily, you know, drive everything in, in my particular direction. So if either of you guys got a place you want to go deeper into or explore, just you know, okay. take the reins out, out of my hands. But we're at five, uh, Matthew five, six through uh, a nine. No, I mean, six through eight, six and eight, six through eight. Somebody read it. Get it going. Uh, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And that's that's, a, that's an ASB. So if you have a different. Well, that's pretty, it's pretty straight up. It's pretty straight up. Right. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I think that's what the first three Beatitudes cultivate in our hearts. It's like, you know, I need help and, you know, this I'm hungering and I'm thirsting. And we know what that means. 
for this thing called righteousness. <clears throat> now, righteousness gets tricky. Righteousness gets tricky. Uh, and I'm not, I can't remember if we ever talked about that word, uh, righteousness. Uh, hmm. Because there's two, uh, the Greek word can be translated two different ways depending on context. It's either, uh, either as righteousness or justice. So, our, so I, mean, I mean, the word for justification and justified shares that root as well. Okay. So when we hear righteousness, we tend to think in terms of kind of an individual standing before God. Right. And we think you think justice and you think more of a, you know, corporate kind of a social justice is that language. Personal. Right. Mm. And, and we tend to kind of orient one way or the other. And, but I think the original readers wouldn't, wouldn't do that. They would just have this, the, the, this concept of, of the right way of being in the world, the way the Lord intends it, and not go my personal standing before God or this, you know, the social dynamic, it's just what would God would have and it incorporates both. Hmm. Right. And there's really not an English word that gets at that very well. I don't think. So we just got to just, you know, just, just kind of make that point. Right. And, and so when, so we're for hungering and thirsting for righteousness, right. Or justice, right. There's this, there's this direction, right? There's this vision that, uh, you know, that we got or we, sh or we should have. And, and the question is, uh, what is it that we're, you know, that the Lord is drawing us to, right? And that's what this kind of, this first beatitude kind of quickens in my, in, in, in my heart. Uh, Dallas Willard in uh, uh, Renovation of the Heart, he has this great acronym for uh, the, you know, the transformation, uh, V-I-M, VIM, which is vision, intention, means. Uh, and, you know, envision, how, you know, how, having a clear picture of what the Lord is, is pulling us towards. Mm -hmm. Right. I, there's something about the, the use of the word hunger and thirst. As I'm sitting right now thinking about, you said the first three Beatitudes kind of cultivate this idea, you know, this um, a recognition in us of what of what we need, right? We need like, oh, okay, we need help. Our limitations are there. Uh, and I was just thinking about, you know, like I I love that he used the word hunger and thirst because if I if I go throughout my you know day to day, whenever I'm hungry or whenever I'm thirsty, even if I can't ignore it for a time. Right? If I can distract myself for a moment, it's not for very long. I always come back to, oh, I'm hungry, <laughs> you know, or like, oh, I'm thirsty. I want that. I want food, or I want water. Or, um, it's just something that is always there, and 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 rarely you can distract yourself from that pretty primal feeling. And I I do not have anywhere close to that level of thought or aching when it comes to the idea of of righteousness or a right living in the world um it does seem like something that i can't ignore for a long time or you know distract myself away from it, it, it doesn't keep it doesn't keep popping up and so i guess it just makes you want to know you know how do how you see the first three beatitudes or or what are some practices right that that um train that appetite i guess i don't know i don't you know what the wording for that would be, but how do you get, how do you get to a place where you are hung, you know, hungering and thirsting for the things that God wants? Man, that is a great question. Yeah. So, so what I did in the sermon yesterday, you know, when I talked about the first three Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, you know, life isn't working for me, right? You know, when the light bulb dawns, you know, comes on. I, and I said, that's just being in touch with reality. A lot of people work hard, have a lot, have, have a lot enough, who have a lot, who have enough money. There it is, to you know, to push that 
that that angst, you know, that gnawing, there must be more at hand, ends this, you know, at, at arm's distance, right? And, but that poor in spirit is, okay, there's, there's something more that I'm not in touch with, okay? Conflict in relationship, cultural confusion, all that stuff, right? Those who identified, mm-hmm. you know, those who mourn shall be comforted, right? So that's opening oneself up to, to recognizing the real problem of the chaos in the world. You know, talk about, I mean, you know, COVID-19, what's going on with India? They're saying, you know, the high point was what, 4,500 deaths in a day. And folks are saying that was probably 10 times. Uh, the, the real number was 10 times that. You're talking 45,000 deaths. You know, we those numbers are just boggling. And then you think about it, the, the danger of, uh, mutations and variants, which gets past vaccines, and we're back into the COVID cycle all over again. E- e- right? Hmm. Um, you know the you know the the distance between the rich and the poor. You know all those disparities, and we can abstract on that, or we can open ourselves to to feel the trauma of that, to feel deeply the. Oh, this is, this is not good. You know, you know, just to meditate on the news headlines. Yeah. No, I, I had the, uh, I, I threw up a, a LA times article of, uh, of the six year old boy who was killed in a road rage incident. Oh. Uh, did you hear about that Christian? Mm-mm. Yeah. A uh, guy was, went, just, just went by the car. His mom was taken to school, fired around kill this kid in the back seat hmm. road rate i mean absolutely senseless hmm. right and you know, what kind of world are we living in hmm. where, where 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 that can happen right so you just okay let's go there well i don't want to go there that's that's not fun right that's not you know that's a that's a buzz kill well Sometimes we need to go there. See, and when we do, we begin to, we be, the, the Lord will begin to cultivate this, this gnawing hunger. Mm-hmm. It's, man, this place has got to get fixed. I need to get fixed. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, so, so, so distractions, you know, the, the allure of comfort for the sake of comfort is kind of the thing that, that yeah helps you ignore it yeah i mean our 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 entertainment culture right is all about you know pushing away boredom or any kind of anxiety or you know all all that stuff which is that's called being alive (laughs) unless you got the money and the systems in the culture to manage what you know, shouldn't be a part of human experience. Sorry, it is a part of human experience because we live in a world that's wrenched from the heart of God. <laughs> right? Okay, let's enter that space. Right? Is is that getting at your question? Is that since? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 no, no, that helps me connect the first three of why the first three beatitudes, the recognition of limitations and that everything's you know broken would lead to a increased appetite of righteousness. So as we go there, we, you know, we want to kind of dial in, okay, what, what is, what, what is Jesus meaning by righteousness? You know, hunger and thirst for, for what exactly, right? Mm. What is he seeing? So what, I mean, what, what comes to mind is. Uh, for me, the first thing that comes to mind is kind of what we talked about in our first Corinthians conversation. Um, that you know, the body is filled of spirit, spirit filled, discerning members um, who are figuring that out in their own contexts, in their own way. Um, that's, I mean, yeah, I, I guess I, to, without getting to a specific thing, that's where my mind jumps to how you even start to define what righteousness looks like for your, your life. Because I'm sure uh, there are broad ones. But, you know, 
how I am to live out, you know, in my community, God's call for, you know, the, the body that I'm in, the city that I'm in would look wildly different from someone around the world or um, from even you guys a few hours away. So. Well, for me, this fourth one necessarily follows the first three, right? Like there's, there's been a certain level of um, disappointment that allows for detachment. You know, um, I've tried my best, but I find myself lacking in spirit. Um, mm -hmm. I arranged all the pieces, but things still broke and things still died. So I'm mourning. Um, you know, and, and, and now we arrive at this place where it well, you know, but I still thirst and desire for, so I, I still have this idea in my brain that there is a right way. There's, there's a right order in the universe. There's a right relationship for me and my creator. Um, it's that hardwired thing that I can't shake, even in the midst of all the disappointments, right, that I've, that I've come to acknowledge the, the first three beatitudes we'd speak to. So I, I think it necessarily follows. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. Just, I mean, all the righteousness, justice, like just how the world is picking up on those cues right now, you know, this high frequency radar that I mean, you, you hear those terms a lot. It's, there's a lot of cries and calls for justice. Um, I don't think we use the word righteousness anymore, but there's certainly behaviors and language and terminology that would indicate, that would signal whether you're on the right side or the wrong side, whether you're righteous or not righteous, right? I mean, with all these things are pinging in the world. Unfortunately, in the world, they're, they're pinging without any sort of, uh, you know, true orientation. That's right. And, and world history is written by, you know, by folks, you know, I mean, driven by, by folks who are trying to establish a right way of being in the world out of their own creativity, out of their own force. I mean, you go to, you go to Hitler, you go to Lenin, you go to Marx, you go to uh, a Napoleon, you go to Caesar. Right. I mean, the Pax Romana, the, uh, the Roman peace, you know, that Roman Empire was really driven by the, uh, the myth of, you know, Rome is going to make things, Rome is going to make things work and everything will be great. Yeah. Well, if you're Roman. <laughs> right. And, and that's an, or, you know, a Napoleon, you know, was started, you know, marching across Europe as the great liberator. And everyone who's, you know, liberated from the oppress oppressive aristocracies of old regime Europe suddenly find themselves under the boot of Republican France, you know, and, and you get all these things always go south, hmm. you know, which is why, you know, Jesus, the king who is crucified, right, and, you know, hunger and thirst for, for a righteousness that comes out of his heart. A righteousness that he establishes, right? That's man, really good, you know. And it's and I th I think it's important for us to you know, not right now, but just as as a you know as as a periodic point of meditation. Oh Lord, what does that righteousness look like for us? Yeah, of course it begins with our own forgiveness. You know, I got. You know, First John one nine. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay. Okay. So that's you know that's our personal standing, you know, uh, before God. But it also has this this corporate component that is uh, that is very very compelling and, and Jesus is going to come back to this uh, in, in a few weeks we'll be talking about you know you for you the salt of the earth and uh, you know you, you are the light of the world you know a city does not you know is not you know city on a hill cannot be hidden you don't light a can't you know light and put a bushel over it you know so there's this corporate witness so it's so it's not only my personal right standing 
there's this, there's this vision of, well, the body of Christ. In fact, flip over, uh, someone turn to uh, Ephesians 4. As good a picture that Paul gives us, probably as anything. Um, Ephesians 4, maybe 11 through 16. Um, and, and make sure we, we, we hear it rightly. You know, that's, that's where, you know, Paul gives gifts of, you know, the, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. I can get, I got it. Okay. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God to a mature man, to measure of the stature, which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects and to him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Right. Yeah. So right understanding of that, that, that mature manhood is a mature humanity. We don't read that individualistically in this. I had to read through verse 16 because it's talking about the sinews and every joint, you know, working together. You, you have that, that kingdom community dynamic that is mm -hmm. a, uh, you know, a brilliant witness to the difference that the Lord makes in redeemed humanity. Right. And so for us to, you know, you know, you know, to the degree that we can meditate on that and, and those on God, what does that look like? Lord, yeah. how, how are you pulling us into a fuller embodied expression of that in our day and age? Yeah. Right. Uh, I could also just say in, uh, it ends with um, building up of itself in love and then again through first corinthians paul's whole chapter on love and just the importance of that's what this is all for right like the the end it's just it's god is love and and so you know the, the thought of like what does righteousness look like in the world like it's just it looks like love very good and so you know so back to i mean dallas willard vision intention means right is is to have a clear vision of that Right. And then, Lord, what does that mean in our day? Intention. All right, let's let's get after that. And then the means to embody that. And that's what the spiritual disciplines are all about. Right. Is, is embracing these practices and patterns so that we come to conform to that vision that the Lord has for redeemed humanity. You know, and that's and it's very and it's very nuts and boltsy. It's very concrete, right? And and our temptation is always to make it abstract and kind of otherworldly. No, no, no. It's it's got to be very, very real. That, that quality of transformation as he pulls us together. <clears throat> the hunger, the hunger and thirst line is helpful in that, right? I mean, it's got to be embodied. I think is what where the two come together. It's got to become a physical habit. Hmm. That's why I like, uh, yeah, Christian, and, and, and you're, uh, you, know, you know, bringing us to that is what was really good. I mean, for us to ache for that in our bodies hmm. so that we, so it, as it begins to get satisfied, <laughs> you know, we, ex hmm. we experience that satisfaction. Hmm. Yeah, it's good. Yeah I, yeah, the, yeah, I guess I didn't think about the, the other end of that, which is, and then when you eat food or when you have, when you, when you quench your thirst, how good it feels, you know, just, just, it is, this, it is a deep satisfaction. Yeah. Yeah. It, all is right. Yeah. That's good. All right. Let's, let's go on to the next one. Verse seven. Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. So as I, as I hear that, 
you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just hearing this, our, our common need for grace. And, you know, as we experience grace, we, we extend grace, you know, and, and it's that, you know, grace is not something so much, well, I, I do experience it. I, I experience profoundly as an individual, but even more as I'm part of a community that is merciful, you know, and, and that grace is a shared experience. Right? I, I, I think of a parable. Well, I don't know what the title is, but it's you've got the, uh, the landowner who has a servant and he pardons him like 10,000 denarii, which is like 80,000 years of a wage. You know, I mean, it's an in, in, in payable amount. And then when he, and then he goes and his servant owes him like a couple months and he doesn't he doesn't forgive him. Uh, that that's just, that's the parable that jumped to my mind of of you know when you know, we we recognizing how forgiven we are, how what debt has been paid on our behalf, and if we truly believed it and understood it, man, how you know of course we forgive, of course we you know we have people who are marked by that. I think that pulls it into who God intends us to be, who God created us to be, you know, not as solitary players, but deeply embedded, not only in him, but in one another, hmm. which is actualized when we, well, in the Lord's prayer, uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us, you know, really, <laughs> you really want to pray that prayer, right? Because it, you know, it, it, it actualizes, I think, who God created us to be. You know, again, um, that back to that Ephesians 4 image of the, you know, the joints and sinews working together as we attain to the fullness of the measure of the statue of Christ together. You know, and, and it's living in that mercy that um, that opens us to that reality and, you know, begins to, you know, shape our, our understanding of the importance of that. You know, it's one of the, you know, the, you know, the more you know, the more you can know kind of a thing. Uh, yeah. Had had a great time with uh, 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 house church Sunday night. Good good job, Matthew, on that resource. By the way, really uh, really kicked off some good good conversation. But Lou is a Lou is a homeless guy who's hanging out with us. He's been coming to church the last two two three weeks. Um, you know, and 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 he was he was really sharing. Uh, I mean some some profound stuff around unforgiveness, you know, and, and resentments and, and how he's just beginning to let go of that and stuff opening up for him, you know, spiritually for him. It was, it was really, and he was, you know, praise the Lord, Lou, you know, way to go. It's powerful by itself. Like you'd think um, there would be, I mean, obviously there are priority needs there, but to be homeless and considering the reality of a need for mercy in your life and, and forgiveness to be working that out when there's these pressing material needs around you, that just speaks to, it just speaks to the, again, just the, the human heart and what, what we actually need, what's What's real? I, I should have said it's beginning, but Kyle and I talked about it a moment on Sunday, but I had the middle schoolers, the fifth through eighth graders on Sunday. So we're working for, through the first three that Kyle's preaching on. And we just got, we stuck on the word blessed for a long time. And I asked him, well, you know, what is it? What is it to be blessed? You know, so fifth through eighth graders, uh, rich, successful, lucky, you know, <laughs> um, and, you know, we were good. I went, okay, good. But, you know, uh, um, now, well, if you're blessed, you're poor in spirit. What is, you know, what, that, you know, so started to tweak and turn their, their brains into what it, you know, what is it to be blessed? I, I think that's really, it's a deeper need, I guess is what I'm getting back to lose example. Like there, there is a blessing 
that is so much deeper and broader than physical comfort or material needs met. Uh, I mean, you, you see that, right? You're glimpsing that. Which, which folds back to the sense of righteousness, which is, which is broader than my sense of forgiveness. It's because I'm forgiven, I'm empowered to extend forgiveness, which connects us up, <laughs> mm. you know, where we be, begin to play team ball. I let, I let go of little petty offense. I know petty offenses don't hook me anymore. You know, they, you know, the old water off the duck's back because there's more, com there's a more compelling thing going on here that I want to attend to. Right. So in this, in this idea of illumination, you know, the way of illumination and the merciful, you shall receive mercy. Right. That's that, that's a revel. That's the, you know, the disciplines of revelation of, of that experiential understanding, you know, you know, that, that light bulb clicking on where, you know, I, I begin to see things I never saw before in human community because I've received mercy. I'm extending mercy mm -hmm. you know, and, and I start, I start realizing gifts that other people bring um i'm i'm open to to hear uh different perspectives uh you know think about the woke you know the woke movement you know which is one of the sources of, of great turmoil you know as a different political identity groups are warring against each other i don't know why don't you just shut up and listen to what somebody's saying and try to grab their perspective for a moment and maybe you might see the world in a little bit different way. And maybe the Lord might want you to do something in response to that. Now, I mean, you can call that woke if you want. I mean, and, and, and what drives me nuts about that whole thing, because you know, that comes from black, black culture. And we say black culture, you're saying, you know, black church, <laughs> Ephesians, uh, five, awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. I mean, that is such a deeply Christian um, expression. That you know, it goes overhead. You know, folks don't realize that. No, that's that. That's a very. It, it comes from the Bible. That I'm alert to realities and conflicts and qualities of, of oppression that I was blind to before. Hmm. Hey, blessed are the merciful. You shall receive mercy. Right? That's, that's, that's revelatory. Yeah. It is, you know, and what I'm thinking, even the link between these two Beatitudes that, and I mean, this is kind of what I was saying a moment ago, that, that you know, the culture is pinging off the idea of justice right now, justice for this person or justice for this group of people or, um, but interesting here that you know that this is immediately followed by mercy because the the worldly models of justice really don't have mercy anywhere built in, oh. and you and you can just see how the the gear immediately grinds, right? Mm. Like we need justice for this, and immediately someone else becomes the victim in under that wheel. Um, whereas mercy is the grease for the gear; it's like it has to be that way, right? We have to be able to forgive one another. And it can't just be one party that's always saying sorry or one party that's always assuming the blame or hmm. it's, you know, the other thing I think is, I mean, this should be, ought to be the most striking thing about the church. I'm just seeing in every other context where you have to earn your way in and earn your place day to day. Um, I'm in this terrible position right now that all school teachers can relate to where I'm passing out final grades, you know, and I got kids throwing things over the transom. You know, here's week four work. Here's the essay that was due two months ago. Here, you know, you're going. And I, I I'm sorry. I was I was one of those students. I'm sorry, Matthew. 
you know, God bless you. I, there's mercy <laughs> here, but I don't know if it's righteousness, you know, and I just go back and uh, forth. Like, what am I doing? Am I teaching this kid terrible habits or am I cutting them some slack? And, you know, uh, <laughs> but, but the idea is, you know, uh, yeah, if, if, if church was that a place where you weren't always performing, where you weren't always, you know, bucking for the grade or whatever it is that you need. Um, and it became a place where you're just known and loved and forgiven <clears throat> communally, communally, um, <clears throat> not just, you know, between right, made right with God. But if there were three people around you that actually held you in that light. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Right. And, and this is under the, under, under the rubric of the illuminative way of, of, of show me how. You know, and it, and it's amazing when you're not, you know, when when you're not holding on to resentments and bitterness, and all of a sudden you're able to value the people around you, and the spirit of God is in that mix. Man, all hmm. kinds of things start lighting off in you. You know that there's you know that that you were just dead to before. Wow. Wow, man. Okay. Let's go to 5.8. <clears throat> um, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. All right. I want to see God. <laughs> well, no one can see God and live. Oh, that's right. right? But you have this, but this is Jesus. What about the cleft, the cleft of the rock thing? The cleft of the rock. Cleft that always rock seems good. So listen, gang, this is... This is Jesus talking now. This is Jesus talking. So he, <laughs> so he knows something, all right. So, I mean, we uh, we carry that from from you know all kinds of places, but Jesus is saying something else. Hmm. Uh, someone flip over to uh, Psalm seventy three, verses one through three. I got that one. If you want. Yep. And and the question is, what threatens quote the pure in heart? Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Ooh. I listened to a message today from um, John Tyson. He's a pastor of the church in Manhattan. Uh and he was talking about one of the ways we experience a failure of heart. Um, he says there's two kinds of failures we can experience in Christian. One is a failure of nerve and the other is a failure of heart. But he's talking about diving into failure of heart. And it's uh, one of the ways is when the world looks pretty good to us. When we go, yeah. you know what, that, you know what, I, I mean, the church has always told me that's not really right. But gosh, comfort looks good or gosh, luxury looks good or gosh you know, sleeping with whoever sounds good, you know, and it, it just, the, the world looks pretty good. Um, yeah. Not, not basically, basically the opposite of the first three Beatitudes, not recognizing our need, not recognizing. Yeah. And not, per, not purgation, not letting go, but like hanging on, you know, well, you know, maybe I'll try that one more time to see if it works. Hmm. And it, it infects the heart. It, you have an impure heart because you're still holding on to whatever that shiny thing in the world is. It still, still calls to you. Yeah. So let's, let's, uh, let's unpack that a little bit more. Right. So the word pure that comes from um, right. Clean. So in, in a sacrificial um system right that's it's that's that's ritually cleansed okay from the pollution of sin in order to make space for god to dwell okay so that's that's the every, everyone get that mm -hmm. right yep. and blood is that cleansing agent in the temple sacrifice sacrificial system okay so so at one level, it's just simply that. And that, that's what 1 John 1, 9 says. If I confess my sins, he is faithful and just 
to forgive me my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Okay. He invites me into a pure heart. Right. But we can also think of a pure as, a, as an undivided heart. Okay. A heart that, you know, desires God as the, you know, as the highest thing. Hmm. Right. So you have in John 13, when Jesus washes his, his uh, disciples feet and Peter says, well, not just my feet, you know, all of me. And Jesus says, uh, you know, you are clean. You just need to wash your feet, but not all of you are clean because you're hmm. talking about Judas who's going to betray him. What was Judas's problem? He had mixed motives, hmm. right? He, he, everybody else is just kind of dialed into Jesus and Judas has a second agenda going on. Okay. So he was unclean, right? He didn't have a clean heart. He was impure there. Hmm. Right? So, you know, it's that uh, the, ver uh, the psalm we read last week, uh, you know, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart because, you know, God is in that, in that place as, you know, as the only word, the only one worthy of our, of our attention and worship, hmm. which is why idolatry is a source of all sin, right? Where, where we allow created things which are good in their place, but when we, you know, allow them to, uh, you know, become focuses of our attention, right? They, uh, they hook us, hmm. right? They, uh, they trip us up. Uh, you know, a third notion is, uh, you know, pure as, as integrated where where your your insides and your outsides are 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 in alignment are connected um mm -hmm. you know so you know matthew 23 25 26 jesus says woe to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence you blind pharisee first clean the inside of the cup and the plate and the outside also may be clean right mm. so it's recognizing there's a disconnection between the outside and the inside you know in, in that you know, hypocrisy right the play acting which jesus is identifying there uh, no, another place we see that is in Psalm 24. Someone turn to Psalm 24. Psalm 24, 3 and 4. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. Okay. I mean, can you see alignment there? Clean hands, pure heart meaning what you intend <laughs> is what you do. Right? I mean, I mean, the word for that is integrity, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and the, and the challenge, you know, is, you know, as, as we, you know, as we desire, you know, to worship the Lord and become who the Lord calls us to be. And we have that clear vision, right. And we have the intention Right, I really want to do this. Okay, we talked about earlier. Desire throws us off that beam. We 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 violate our intention all the time, and so that's where the purgative way needs to you know do some work to shape our 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 desire, and that's where that mourning comes in to feel deeply. But then there's the means. Okay, how how do I align? what I desire on the inside and you know, this vision of, of righteousness, of justice, of what God intends with what I do. Right. That's the means. Right. And then, and then, and then we come back to spiritual disciplines, right. 
and attending to these practices and patterns where our bodies, right, our flesh, you know, begins to dial into who the Lord has saved us to be for real, mm. right? Which, which makes the spiritual life nuts and bolts, <laughs> not abstractions. I think, I think, uh, yesterday we gathered as a, as a, a community and just started talking about kind of the things that we want, you know, what are some of our, uh, you know, what are we looking for in a, in a body of believers? You know, what are some of the core things? And, uh, Mike Brown, uh, kind of made a, a clarifying statement in the beginning saying, it's really easy for the church to over spiritualize these things, you know? Um, and he, and he's like, I don't want to talk about, you know, for example, you know, we can say like, Hey, you know, the phrase God is working all things together for, you know, you're good. So, you know, if you're sad, don't worry, it's going to be fine. You know, it's a, let's get to happiness and and then skipping over the part where we just really mourn. Um, and so he, he really called us to not, yeah, not, not find those things in like the, the spiritual realm, but you know, what really is, is tugging at our hearts right now. And what, what are the things that are, uh, you, you want to see in a community, which I think is, is helpful. I, again, just growing up in the church, I think that it is very easy for me to over spiritualize a lot of, um, what the Bible says as, uh, kind of putting it more in the, in the realm of magic than in the realm of reality. Yep. Yep. And, and the devil wants us to live there for sure. Because, because it's not real. It's not real unless it's embodied. I was in a conversation <laughs> with some friends. Um, I'll just say this. We're, we're talking about youth soccer. I coach Paige's 6U soccer team. And then I get to cheer for uh, Ashley and Jacob's 10U soccer team. This is Tatchby. This is Bear Valley. This is, you know, the Bible Belt of California, if there is such a thing. And if you want to watch the disconnect between good Christians with solid doctrine, watch a referee miss a call <laughs> on their kid. You know, and it's like the world, you know, the world comes undone. And um, <laughs> there is no mercy. And there is no, I mean, there's this weeping and gnashing of teeth. It, it, it's, it's, but, but the, you know, the, the, the problem for me, it identifies is, and I'll, I'll speak to myself, I can have all the right ideas and right thinking in the world, and I can have proof text and verses to back them all up. But until somehow that allows me to cheer joyfully for my kid from the sideline and not want to kill a referee, you know, some, some, there's, there's, it's not permeated my heart. Hmm. yeah okay so here's dallas willard from the spirit of the disciplines <clears throat> the physical human frame as created was designed for interaction with the spiritual realm that's cool the physical human frame right was designed for interaction with the spiritual realm and this hmm. interaction can be resumed at the initiative of God. Then, through the disciplines of the spiritual life, that interaction can be developed by joint efforts of both God and the person alive in the dynamism of the spirit. Right? That's a lot, Kyle. That's a lot. So you got in, so you're you, you're developing different muscle memory different mental models so that when the referee blows the call, you don't go to what an idiot you go to nice try. <laughs> <laughs> right. You don't go to, you know, you took something from my little darling, right? You go to, this is a good lesson for my little darling to learn. Yeah. Right. 
mm. or how grateful I am for these unpaid volunteers that showed up on a Saturday and are trying to wrap a kid's game. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, one of my most uh, I'm not traumatic, you know, but you know, you get the guys are in minor league, you know, I don't know, is it is either Nick or Mike and they, and they needed a second second base umpire, you know. Someone had to volunteer. And I'm, you know, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> oh, <my Lord. laughs> I'm a pastor, man. I'm not used to getting hacked like that. I'm not a cop, you know. Yeah. Gosh, you know, you know, but but the Lord calls us to, you know, to to develop again the muscle memory, mental models, so so that we respond dramatically different in the world. Right. And as we're centered on him, you know, the pure in heart. Right. I, I love that phrase. Uh, but that uh, by joint efforts of both God and the person alive in the dynamism of the spirit. Alive in the dynamism of the spirit. See, that's what's preserved in the pure heart. Right. I'm. Mm -hmm. I'm wide open to what the Holy Spirit wants to tell me in this moment. Hmm. Right. right. That's the, you know, again, show me how and he will, you know, and that's, you know, it's like going to a golf pro and you've got, you've, you've picked up all the wrong habits, hacking in a golf ball and the golf pro says, Hey, don't, don't drop your right shoulder. And you got to focus real hard. Don't drop my right shoulder. Okay. Don't my right shoulder you know that's hard to do you know not dropping your right shoulder when you've been doing it all your life right hey, but you can do it hey, don't uh, you drop your right shoulder right and the holy spirit wants to have that dialogue with you hmm. isn't that cool yeah I, I i love the i love the note that our physical frames were meant to interact with the spiritual realm like just like by design you know yeah. this is a cool that's a great again a reality that we it's just that's that perspective shift. Oh, that's that's real. And we have every confidence in the world that the Holy Spirit will the paraclete, the coach, right? Hmm. The paraclete means the one who comes alongside to speak. Hmm. Will eh, nice try. Try again. Yeah. You don't have that quite down yet. You don't have that. Oh, there you go. boy. Right? Hmm. Cool. As, as a live thing. Okay. Uh, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Okay, Jesus. What in the world? Right? Any thoughts? Um, the first thing that kind of comes to my mind, I'm sitting outside, it's really windy. And it's just that very overused, probably, maybe it's a good analogy. That's why it's overused so much. But like, I can't see the wind, but I can see what the wind does. Uh, and I think in a lot of life, that's been how I see God. You know, I just, I see what he is doing around me. I see relationships changing, or I see uh, communities becoming healthy or I see, you know, justice or whatever. Right. And, and in that sense, that is, well, you know, I, I feel like, Oh, no, that's God, you know, I don't see that. And so that's just kind of, uh, that's how, when I think of the, the phrase seeing God, my most common uh, form of that is just in what he is doing or how he is moving in the world around me. Well, that's, that's Jesus in John three. As he's talking to Nicodemus, that's where that image comes from. Hmm. So Jesus agrees with you. Oh, great. <laughs> that's pretty good, Christian. That seems like a good spot to land. <laughs> yeah. You know, two other thoughts that occur to me is, you know, one is, I mean, the, uh, the classics talk about the, the beatific vision, right? Uh, and so in, in John, I mean, 1 Corinthians 3, 12, you know, for now we see in a mirror darkly, but but then face to face, mm -hmm. you know, be you know coming into the presence of God is called the, you know, the beatific vision, quorum Deo, living before the face of God, right? There's you know, I mean, there's that, there's that hope, and we'll say more about that when we get in. I mean, to the next week with the unitive way, you know, this whole notion of union, 
you know, but, you know, but, but there's also this, you know, for me, uh, you know, not to diminish Christian, what you said, I think that's great. I mean, we, we see God in his effects. Um, you know, there's the beatific, the, the beatific, the beatific vision, uh, you know, but also, you know, in one another, in this, in the kingdom community, you know, we are created to hmm. body the image of God, right? To reflect God's glory, you know, back into creation. Hmm. And so as we, you know, as he, as the Lord moves deeply in us, you know, the pure in heart, you know, shall see God. Wow. You know, as the spirit comes to rule and to reign in our lives, in our community. Wow. Maybe there's a little bit of that going on. Um, and again, I think, you know, the salt of the earth, you know, uh, the light of the world stuff, I think is pointing towards that. Yeah, it's, it's always struck me in John. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And here in the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to hear Jesus say, you are the light of the world. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's a, huh, okay, okay, Jesus, if you say so, you know. Hmm. The, uh, uh, the spiritual discipline, you know, for, for uh, the way of illumination, show me how, uh, goes by the Latin term Lectio Divina. Lectio Divina. Matt, you 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 got the notes there, right? Yeah, I want to read it. Yeah, go ahead and read Calhoun's definition. Yeah, the hearing of Scripture requires an open, reflective, listening posture, alert to the voice of God. This type of reading is aimed more at growing a relationship with God than gathering information about God. Or, as our friend Hal Perkins said, are you listening to me? Yeah. And one of the classic ways of, of approaching the scriptures in that in, as is discipline is not that you're reading the Bible so much as the Bible is reading you. Mm. Right. So you're attentive to, okay, what is, what is the spirit speaking to me? You know, reading slowly, reading deeply, reading attentively. And that's what, Perkins is getting at with that, the third question in his model, which is, you know, are you listening to me? And, and the challenging thing for us is in, in a technological culture, we read to master, you know, we, we, we read to master information to gain knowledge, which gives us more power and all of that. Hmm. This is not. Name, yeah. I've said this before, but the name of the, you know, the, program i'm in for spiritual direction is sila and that's that word that we find in the psalms and it's a i guess it's an untranslatable word we don't really know what it means other than it seems to indicate a, a pause a beat a second where you wait you know and you, and you behold in a sense and so i think that's kind of a helpful you know because we've all you know not we've all Anyone who's been a Christian very long has attempted some sort of Bible study or devotion or a psalm a day or, a, you know, gospel a month or whatever, you know, or the Bible in a year or whatever it is. And so it's, you know, you read and check and read and check and read and check. But to read and pause and listen and, you know, and, and even be quiet and use that physical frame of yours to be still before the, the word. I mean, I think it's really, really powerful. Hmm. But it's a it's a new set of muscle. It's a new muscle memory, right? It's not, as Kyle said, it's not what we do when we read the newspaper or an email or any other type of reading. So it's a re, it's a retraining for sure. Yeah, and that's why I like the the Latin language lectio divina. You know it. That, I mean, just saying that, what, what do you mean? Glad you asked, right? Yeah. It just throws us off. Oh, it's a different kind of thing, right? So as we, as we you know, can continue on, uh, you know, the way of illumination, remember, right? It's, it's the disciplines of revelation, which is, 
yeah, certainly it moves at the level of, of understanding, but it's that, man, it's that light bulb comes on when you hear the voice of God, man, and he reveals himself, reveals something about yourself that you'd never knew, you know, you weren't in touch with before and, and everything changes. Mm-hmm. Boy, and, and, and to know that that's, that's what's going on. Mm-hmm. Well, some good stuff. Mm-hmm. All right. The illuminative way. Show me how someone pray. I got it. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Thank you so much for um, for another day, man. I we just don't want to uh, take for granted that we are here again. Um, just enjoying uh, fellowship with with your children and and pouring over your word and um, and breathing <laughs> breathing your breath. So we praise you and we recognize you as the author of, of all things created. God, as we uh, as we are going through uh, <laughs> the sermon that you preached, uh, may we um, may we do it slowly, uh, and and uh, we may we be listening to uh, to what you are trying to tell us uh, today and this week and, and where we are, Father, in, in these stages of our lives. Thank you for your word and um, bless all who uh, well, <laughs> who hear it. And uh, in these things, we we thank you and, and lift up in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. Right on. All right, Matthew, finish strong. What do you got, a week or two? When, when, when's your last day? Students graduate Wednesday. And then I got hey. a few more days. This week? Wednesday this week? Yeah, Congratulations, you did it. It's a wow. Zoom year. Close enough. You know, we got within a week. It's okay. <laughs> uh, all right. Zooming into the future. All right. Zooming into the future. All right, guys. Thanks for listening. <laughs>